Okay, today I have with me Lyle McDonald. Hi Lyle, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Glad, thank you for having me on. Thank you, I'm doing very well. Um, <clears throat> before we start the interview, um, the topic today is fat loss for females. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a um, short introduction about yourself and your background and how you got involved in the fitness industry? Sure. Um, I kind of fell into it. I actually grew up as sort of a very sedentary kid, played a lot of video games. You know, this was early 80s. Um, my parents weren't really athletes, uh, both musicians. I got into sports in high school. Um, my, my high school had mandatory athletics and got into road cycling, martial arts. I was part of the swim team and I just kind of really um, enjoyed that and, you know, started to see my body change, which I really liked and, and um, got into gymnastics in my senior year. And, and that's kind of what led me to go to uh, UCLA to pursue exercise physiology for all practical purposes. Um, originally, I wanted to be a coach and then after a knee injury, I wanted to do physical therapy. And then uh, about that time, I started doing uh, a lot of competing in uh, inline skating, rollerblading, which you know, early 90s was, was a very super popular sport. And since I was at best a mediocre athlete, I got very interested just in the science of physiology, nutrition, supplements, you know, like everybody else, I read all the magazines. This was, you know, pre-internet. Uh, I saw all the advertisements, you know, I wanted it to work. And the more I talked to my exercise physiology professor, the more I realized how much of it was a lot of nonsense. So, that's about the time I started to really get into, you know, PubMed and Medline and getting into the research stacks and, and actually reading the original studies. So honestly, most of my interest in this, like so many people, was to make myself better. You know, dietitians frequently overweight, psychologists are usually a little bit crazy. You're trying to fix yourself. And, you know, got a graduated college in 93. I was racing mainly inline skating. That was about the time the internet started. Uh, I was on it from the beginning in 94 through the early 90s with the Usenet groups. And um, a lot of websites were, you know, people knew they needed to have websites. Nobody knew why. They just knew that they needed to have one. And so, some, you know, places seemed to like my writing, started to either ask me to, to contribute or, you know, pay me to write articles. That was about the time I wrote my first book, which was uh, The Ketogenic Diet on Low-Carbohydrate Diets. Got involved in Dan Duchesne's Body Opus. And I, I really just honestly fell into it. You know, I just was kind of writing on the internet and people seemed to like it. And I mean, I was training people at the same time, and I just kind of gradually got more into the writing end of things. And since then, you know, my first book, 96, 97, since then, I think I've done 12 books on just various topics of, you know, nutrition, fat loss, um, the occasional odd little kind of drug-related booklet, uh, really not my interest, so I haven't done much with that. Um, so really just kind of like a happy set, you know, happy accident. Sports in high school, studied it in college, wanted to be better. You know, I just was lucky enough to turn it into a career. Excellent. And you're currently writing uh, two books? Yes. So the short version of long story is I started a book about February of last year. Um, someone had actually plagiarized one of my earlier books, and I just got very angry about that and decided that I really should rewrite it. And I decided I should add a section and add a section and add a section. And suddenly it was a whole different book. And, you know, one thing I haven't really talked about or written about is kind of general fat loss. There's a lot on my website, but most of my books tend to be very specific topics or specific diets. And, and I really needed to write something more general. And that's kind of what this book became. And I just I pulled a lot from other projects and other books and wrote a lot of new information and wrote a lot about uh, behavior change and adherence, which I really honestly think is – I really think that's the key. You know, quick just getting off topic. You know, everybody can lose weight in the short term. Everybody. The long-term weight maintenance is really where – the issue lays is why can't people sustain it for more than you know a year or two or three you know we know how to exercise we know how to set up diets this is not this is no longer interesting information to me why are people so bad at, at maintenance but regardless so that book kind of was mostly done minus one section that I've been avoiding for about a decade and uh, now I know remember why 
And that section had to do with women and fat loss, right? I've known for years that women have it more difficult, that often approaches that work for men don't work well. You know, we know empirically a lot of the things to at least roughly do, but I had never really addressed it in detail. And I started that section and was like, well, it shouldn't take me more than a couple of chapters. And then, then it became a section. And then the more I talked about it online, all the women were like, oh, God, we need this book, right? Because there's, there's really not as much information out there or what is out there is just nonsensical. You know, there's, there's so much stuff targeted at women. It's, it's true for men, but I think proportionally there's more good training and diet advice for men. And women, women are frequently just treated like little men in all areas of medicine, physiology, psychology, you know, you name it. And there's reasons for that. Um, women are much more difficult to research. A lot of it I think was just, sexist bias you know male researchers study men and just figured well we'll just treat women like smaller versions and it's abundantly clear now that that is simply not the case and again a lot of things that work for men in terms of general fat loss health lower body fat is a big issue for women just doesn't work it just doesn't and so the the further I got into this project the more complicated it got and, and the more I realized what uh, a, a, what sort what size of project that I'd take it on, like I thought it would be eh, eighty to one hundred pages. You know, I'm now four hundred pages in, and it just keeps expanding. And and we'll we'll touch on this, but women are complicated in a way that men simply aren't. Um, are is there a difference between men? Absolutely, genetic differences. One has high testosterone. One has, like the, the differences are there, but they tend to be very quantitative. In women, the qualitative differences are just enormous. Um, and something I know we're going to touch on is women can have a, a number of different, you know, what I'm calling hormonal profiles that change their physiology subtly to not so subtly. Sometimes you're looking at a completely different physiology between two women, and you just don't really see that in men. So that's kind of the background on, on where this project started. And I'm trying to cover, you know, not only general physiology, because a lot of folks, even women, don't know this stuff. I mean, I did. When I started this project, none of these words made any sense to me. And I had to really get up to speed on a whole new kind of set of physiology, um, how to do you know the menstrual cycle and all these different hormones. Um, so I'm covering you know enough of that for background. I've got to cover a lot of you know body composition stuff and and general physiology, but really trying to address the differences between women and men in terms of nutrient metabolism, exercise metabolism, energy expenditure. You know, you name it. Um, when I get into training, there's differences in injury risk and different types of strength, eccentric versus concentric strength, and women may have better endurance than men, and you know, there's a lot of anatomical differences that have to be taken into account. So, so it's really turned into an enormous project, and it's, it's currently just crushing me. Like it's just an exhausting, because it's, it's the deeper I look, the more I find, and I'm, I'm reaching a point that I'm having to be like, this is enough. Um, you know, I've, I've got enough of the big picture. Everything else is details. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. And hopefully that'll be done this year. I sure hope it's done. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know a lot of people are really looking forward to the yeah. book coming out. Okay, so let's start with the first question. You touched a bit upon um, physiology. Yeah. What's is the, what makes it more difficult for females to lose fat compared to men when it, in terms of physiology? Well, in, in, in a very general sense, just to give some background, you know, a question we might even address initially is you know, why this is the case. Why are women and men so different in this regard? And, and really the most interesting theory I've seen that I will talk about in the book is in a very real way, women are responsible for the survival of the human race, right? Women have to deal with pregnancy, which carries a huge energetic cost. It can cost something like 50,000 calories above normal just to take a child from conception through birth. She has to deal with breastfeeding. She has to deal with raising the child till he's five. You know, in a very real sense, once the male has contributed his one thing, he kind of doesn't matter anymore. Like, I mean, it's helpful if he hangs around. But, but the idea is that women's bodies evolved to not only store fat effectively 
in preparation for pregnancy, but to handle things like starvation, which dieting is simply starvation on a, a longer time scale, um, better than men because they were so much more critically important in the big scheme of things. Uh, it, it, in a weird way, you know, if you're in a famine or something, the female gets pregnant, it's almost better for the male to die. And, and men are more likely to die during famines, during in concentration camps, during, you know, they've had potato famines and or World War II and things. Men are more likely to die than women. But in a real, very real sense, it's better if they do. That leaves more resources for her and the child. But that's kind of, so that's kind of the, the general reason why. As far as specific reasons, um, women differ in how they store fat after a meal. Uh, women tend to store a greater percentage of Dietary fat, men tend to burn more of it. Um, in between meals, women tend to uh, use less fat for fuel um, than, than men. Women tend to sort of switch to carbohydrates, although that even depends on where in the menstrual cycle they are, and we'll touch on that next. Um, do realize that part of this, a lot of, a lot of differences in physiology, right, if you get back into the history of it, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of the studies were finding these differences, right? Ah, women burn less fat than men. Well, yeah, women are smaller. Women have less lean body mass than men. Of their lean body mass, women have less skeletal muscle. So comparing it in absolute terms is very misleading. Even comparing it in percentage terms, once you start dividing a lot of this by body weight or by the amount of lean body mass they have, and here I'm using lean body mass to refer to organs, skeletal muscle, brain, like not just muscle mass. When you start dividing a lot of this out, a lot of these differences disappear. Not all of them, but a large number of them, right? So women have a lower resting metabolic rate. Well, they're smaller, they have less lean body mass. Of course they do. When you start dividing this stuff out, you find that for the lean body mass they have, roughly speaking, their, their energy expenditure is about the same. It's just going to be less because they're smaller, right? On average, a woman will carry 10 to 12 percent more body fat, 10 to 12 percent less lean body mass. So like right there, a big difference shows up. The, the man will be heavier, which means during exercise, he'll burn more calories. Because he's got more muscle mass, he can handle, he can generate higher power outputs. He can generate, you know, so he can burn more calories kind of in absolute terms. So a lot of the work that was done early on may have kind of reached some, some oddly incorrect conclusions, right? If you put two, a man and a woman on a 20% deficit, right? So the woman's maintenance is 2,000 calories and the man's maintenance is 3,000 calories. 20% deficit, she's on 400 calories, he's on 600. Of course he loses more weight. Like, of course he does. Um, because he, because simply, generally speaking, women can't create the same size deficit, right? If the woman were on 600 calorie deficit, 600 over 2,000 is uh, whatever. It's, all, it's almost 33%. It's something in that range. The, de the same absolute deficit is much harder on her. So a lot of these things, you know, even during exercise, some work has shown that if you make women, men and women burn the same number of calories during exercise, they do lose the same amount of fat. However, the women have to exercise 25 to 33% longer. So if a man and a woman do 45 minutes the same intensity, she will lose less fat because she burns less calories. So that's a big part of it. However, that's certainly not all of it. Listeners need to realize most researchers don't study lean women. Right? Why would they? Unless you've got very specific athletic concerns or dealing with, with athletes, weight loss for people that are lean is not, an, is not a question obesity researchers care about. They tend to look at extremely obese women or just overweight women. That's a very different population. Right? If you're dealing with a woman at 40% body fat who may be 250 to 300 pounds, that's very different than a 140-pound female athlete at 22% trying to get to the teens or, you know, trying to get contest lean or 10 to 12 percent, you know, for, for endurance performance. So I think a lot, a lot of the studies tend to be, be in a population that I don't know is generally applicable. Um, but outside of that physiology, one of the things you see with, with women is there's more variability. Their bodies in many ways adapt, they adapt better to 
uh, imbalances in or perturbations in energy homeostasis. That's the technical version of it. Basically, whenever women are exposed to some sort of energetic stress, their bodies are more efficient at dealing with it. And that comes out of those evolutionary pressures, right? So male and female, if you starve them, a woman's body will fight back harder so she survives longer, so she's more likely to make it for pregnancy, yada, yada, yada. Like that's kind of the, the, the general basis. And, and that tends to really cover or explain a lot of the differences. So an example, um, well, a little bit of background. So total daily energy expenditure. We've got resting metabolic rate, how many calories you burn at rest. The thermic effect of food, how much you burn just from me metabolism when you eat. Even there, there's a difference. Women typically eat less than men. Their thermic effect of food is less in absolute terms. It's still about the same 10%, but you burn less eating 1,500 versus 2,500. Uh, thermic effect of activity, that's formal exercise. Like I said, women tend to burn less during exercise by dint of being smaller and having less muscle. But then there's also this, this non-exercise activity thermogenesis, this issue. It's the calories you burn and everything that's not formal exercise. So fidgeting, moving from standing to seated, pacing around, walking from the car to the grocery store, that all gets kind of you know, stuck under, under neat. Um, that, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And it's really turning out that that's the big player in most of this stuff. That's where the biggest variance is between people. That's the place we can really have the biggest impact in fat loss. And I bring this up because frequently in women, if you expose them to a change one place, like you lower their calories or you increase their exercise, what you see is a compensation somewhere else. So in one of the earlier studies, they took men and women and they put them both on I don't know, it's like a 40-week bicycle training program, whatever it was. And the men, in response to the, the calories burned from exercise, their total daily energy expenditure went up, right? So the, the calories they burned during exercise added to what they had normally be burning. In the women, it didn't have as much of an effect. Well, that means that somewhere else, and probably in NEAT, she had to compensate more, right? Her body sensed that energetic stress from exercise, decreased NEAT later in the day. That's really where a lot of these big differences show up, is women show the, these differences in how uh, strongly and frequently how quickly they adapt. And I know one of your later questions, which we can sort of come full circle, is, you know, what differences practically does this make in terms of refeeds and diet breaks and things of that nature? But women's bodies are very much responding more quickly than men. Um, here's another uh, bit of trivia. So listeners may be familiar with the hormone leptin. Short version, leptin, at least primarily from fat cells, tells the brain how much fat you have and how many calories you're eating. The drop in leptin with dieting, big part of the signal to make you hungrier, slow energy expenditure, all the adaptations. So if you have women, men and women exercise and then feed them enough to, to, to offset that, right, there's still a calorie balance, men's leptin doesn't change. Women's leptin does. Their leptin still drops even if they're eating enough. Women's leptin drops more over a week of dieting than a man's. Her levels, her, her entire system is responding more strongly and more quickly than a male's is. Now, again, in that obese population, these adaptations aren't as big of a deal, right? A woman with 40% body fat is not at risk of starving to death. She's got plenty of fat stored if she gets pregnant. In a sense, the body couldn't care. Right? If you've ever obese people, as much, you know, we usually think of, ah, they have a harder time. Actually, it's the opposite. Generally speaking, if you can put them on a basic program, they lose more weight and fat. They're heavier. They have more fat to lose. As people get leaner, men and women, the body fights back harder. And once you get into, uh, I hate to use the word natural, but, you know, a more, just a lower body fat percentage range, if you're looking at women between, say, you know, 19 and 24% body fat, which is lean without being super lean, that's where the stuff really starts to happen. That's when the body, you know, for men, the equivalent is about 12 to 15%, somewhere in there. And, you know, most guys can get to 15, 13, 14, 15%, no sweat. 
Now they try to get to single digits, and that is a pain in the ass. For women, it's the same sort of thing. When you're a lot heavier, it's not that big of a deal. In the middle range, it starts to become a little more prevalent. And as you get really lean, the body is just like, okay, we're starving to death. We don't have enough fat to carry pregnancy. And that's when women's bodies shut down. And when that happens, you see decreases in thyroid hormone, decreases in energy expenditure. They burn less calories during exercise. You burn less, you, you tend to move around less. I mean, this happens in both men and women, but women's bodies overall tend to respond differently. Um, another example that comes up in a lot of the chapters and, and literature that's written about this, women's bodies respond differently to heat and cold stress, right? Men will start to sweat sooner, and will start to shiver later, right? Women's bodies sort of respond very differently. Anytime you sort of uh, impact on their energy balance, their bodies tend to really fight to maintain homeostasis a lot harder. Another example is some early studies on exercise showed that women lost no weight while men did. Now, what it turns out to be is that there's more variability in one of the classic studies, right? So here's the zero line. I hope people can see this. About half the women lost, but half the women gained because they got hungry and ate. The diets weren't controlled. All the men lost. So on, when you average it out, the men lost weight. The study said, oh, the, men, the women didn't lose any. Well, that's not true. Some women lost uh, quite a bit, but some women didn't. Women's systems are more variable in this regards and how hard they fight back. But generally speaking, exercise for women doesn't work very well unless they control their diet because their body tends to ramp up hunger to try to offset that. Their bodies may start to decrease that, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis more effectively, which means that you can burn all the calories you want in the morning. You can go bust your butt and do 600 calories of exercise. But if your body makes you burn 400 less later in the day because it's, it's adapting to that, well, guess what? You burn 200 calories total over, you know, than you would have. Women's bodies do that to a greater degree. So like I said, men, eh, just tell them to exercise, and they will, and they'll lose weight because their bodies don't. Women have to be far more, have to be more detail-oriented in terms of paying attention to their diet, paying attention to these other components that, that tend to adapt more quickly. So that, that really, to me, you know, on top of the differences in fat storage and, and the differences in fat metabolism, and there's some other issues going on that get into a lot of details that are in the book. But the big end of it for me is, is that women's bodies are fighting back harder and sooner, and that alone will tend to, to slow fat loss, as much, you know, and, and the body's trying to just keep you alive, number one, and keep her fertile and, and able to maintain pregnancy or, or fertility. Wow, excellent. Just a follow-up question. What, mm -hmm. about, uh, what about males that have females' fat patterns? Will they also have issues like the females, or? Um, not. It's a good question. It's, I actually wrote a really detailed article about this on my website. That'll probably probably be, be a little bit easier. And and in general, I would say probably not. You know, there women have. There's a lot going on in terms of what sort of dictates male and female physiology. One is genetics, right? Women have XX chromosomes. Men have XY. We're starting from a different genetic place. There's a lot of programming that occurs uh, during fetal development, depending on hormonal exposure. So if you expose a female to more testosterone, it masculinizes her brain. It can give her different bone structure. It can do things to her biology. Similarly, a male that has less androgen exposure may have a more feminized brain. Different, you know, I, I don't know if you've done anything on and looked at, you know, the two to the, the finger digit ratio. Yeah. That's indicative of all, of all of that and correlates very well with a number of different things. Once you get out of it, you know, really the big differences in men and women, um, if you look at young, like uh, pre puberty, the pre puberty males and females, the physiology is not that different. Women carry a little bit more body fat. There's, a, there's some minor differences. The biggies really show up at puberty, which is where men's testosterone levels go through the ceiling, women's estrogen and progesterone levels, which are their primary reproductive hormones, start their menstrual cycle. And that's really where you see the changes in body type. Men grow muscle, women grow less muscle and more fat. Differences in bone growth, behavioral stuff, you know, that's when men, little boys turn into macho idiots. That's when women's behavior changes very significantly. Um, 
So, I mean, it, it's, it, you know, men that have more lower body fat patterning have some aspect of women's physiology. I don't know that, that it's been looked at, you know, are there brains? Well, brains are really where most of this is happening, right? All these signals from the body, leptin from the fat cells, ghrelin from the stomach, you know, insulin, blood sugar. There's all these signals that go into the brain of the hypothalamus. I don't know offhand if a male that, that has that fat pattern has a more feminized brain in terms of how it will, will respond. They do have the same fat loss problems, absolutely. They, they have those same so, – so that I'm going to say maybe. I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, you know, and it, even with all of this, you can find males that get lean no problem. Right, their bodies just don't fight back. One of the things that shows up in all the studies that look at changes in metabolic rate, changes in all of this, the variability is huge. Right, so on average, someone's metabolic rate may drop by 250 calories. Some people, it's about 50. Other people, it's 500. Some people are objectively more screwed than others. Genetics, biology, it's just the luck of the draw. So. And I think that's even part of the problem. There are women that get away with very damaging approaches to dieting and training when they get very lean. It doesn't hit them as hard. And men do it too. And I think that gives the normal person a really skewed idea of what's realistic or how they should approach it. Um, in general, I think you know women do have to approach things a little bit differently and more carefully than men. They have to do some slightly different things with – with their exercise, with their training, you know, I, I would say at least some of the reason women have more trouble losing fat, you know, and now we're talking about general population, right? In the physique group, bodybuilding, fitness, figure, that stuff, they're doing what those groups have always done. They're doing a lot of resistance training. They're keeping their protein high. A lot of women in general – that's not what they're biologically drawn to, right? Bio women tend to prefer carbohydrates and fats. Men tend to prefer protein. If a woman wants to lose weight, where's the first place she goes? The cardio deck. She goes to the treadmill. She goes to the bike. She goes to this type of exercise that is burning some fatty acids, make no mistake, but it's not burning a lot. Um, one difference I didn't touch on, right? So, Surprisingly, women burn a larger percentage of fat during aerobic exercise than men, which seems very backwards. Like, why if they burn more fat, do they lose less fat? Well, number one, what you burn during exercise doesn't really matter. It's the other 23 hours of the day. However, while women burn a greater percentage of total fat, they burn a larger percentage of fat stored within the muscle. Right? It's called intramuscular triglyceride. So they burn less, they're mobilizing less fatty acids from their fat cells. They're burning fat that's actually stored in the muscle. So yeah, fantastic. They're burning some amount of fat. And even then, if you look at the total fat burning during aerobics, it's not very much. Like you're burning, whatever, 40 grams of total fat per, you know, per workout. Well, that's fantastic. And if 20 of those are actually getting pulled out of your fat cells, well, the average a pound of fat has 450 grams of fat. So, you know, do the math. You're looking at 23 workouts, you know. So to burn, and, and again, what's going on the rest of the day is really what's more important. But you get women, they go do nothing but low-intensity exercise. They're not getting enough protein. Resistance training because of what it does metabolically and I think in terms of fuel use in the body by depleting muscle glycogen. Like women that have done that, as soon as you get them to raise protein, lower carbs, and weight train, it's magic. Like it's – it's you can see this online all the time. Every woman that, that reports finally getting some heavy weight training and changing their diet, it's it's magic. Like the difference is profound and I think even there's part of it. Men are biologically prone to doing some of the right things. When a man wants to lose weight, what does he do? Eats all the protein and goes to the weight room. He's almost like biologically drawn to what more women should do. So I think even that's part – I mean not – the biology is clearly a big part of it. But there are kind of a lot of the, the approaches that women take that would work for men. If men go do – Lots of cardio, they will lose weight. And for women, if they're not controlling their diet, if they're not, you know, and a lot of women diet with the most ridiculous, oh God, the, just the, the stuff you hear about, um, and that's all they're doing, it just doesn't have the same effect. In, in a man, it will. And, you know, the, some other differences, getting back to the physiology. Upper body fat and lower body fat is very different to mobilize. Upper body fat comes off really easily, um, even in women. 
like women's upper body fat gets mobilized pretty well for exercise. It's their hip and thigh fat, right? And as, as women get lean, what happens? They get a gaunt face, ripped delts. They get a six pack way before men. Pisses men off. Mm -hmm. Men have lean legs and, and a fat tummy and want a six pack. Women have a six pack and fat legs and want to look like the man. Um, so there, you know, that that's less to do with total fat loss and, and more of a regional issue. But because men have that more easily mobilized upper body fat, they have more easily mobilized visceral fat on top of the being heavier, burning more calories, easier to diet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That contributes significantly, and that's then you get into to all of the the adaptations. So women, a friend of mine put it about 15 years ago and just said, yeah, women are screwed. And I think that kind of sums it up to her. I mean, th there are ways to get around a lot of this and, and I wouldn't be writing this book to just go, Hey, you're out of luck. Um, I, you know, I'm going to propose a lot of, um, recommendations and, you know, and, and fixes to, to try to at least, you know, you can't change it, but you can work around it and at least address it. So. Okay. So let's look at some of the other issues. Could you, yeah. <clears throat> could you explain how birth control pills and the menstrual cycle can affect fat loss for females? Sure. Yeah. Let me talk about the, the, the menstrual cycle first because to me, like really when you get down to the, the basis of it, right? A, a woman's – if you look at a woman's skeletal muscle under a microscope, it looks just like a man's. If you look at her liver, it looks just like a man's. If you look at her you – know, most of that is pretty much the same as far as the tissues. When you really see the first big difference is, like I said, is, is that when puberty hits. That's when men's testosterone goes up, and that's when women start their menstrual cycle. So, so really, that's the sort of the basis of all of this because it's these reproductive hormones that are, are really having the biggest difference, right? Men produce some estrogen and progesterone, which are the primary female hormones. Women produce testosterone and other androgens. Each sex has all of these hormones but in drastically different levels. Men typically have 10 to 30 times more testosterone than women, but they have significantly less estrogen or progesterone. Women, it's the, you know, very low levels of testosterone. It's just it's not their primary reproductive hormone with a couple of exceptions that, that I'll come to. And even the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle represents the roughly 28-day phase, and it's actually not 28 in most women, from one menstruation from when they start bleeding to the next. And this is just, it's this, this site, and it's divided in half by ovulation. That's when the egg is released in, in preparation for pregnancy. So the two big reproductive hormones are estrogen, which I imagine most listeners know of, and then progesterone, which is the, I mean, there's other little ones that, those, these are the, the two key players. There's different kinds of estrogens. The main one in premenopausal women is estradiol. So that's the only one I'm really going to, gonna when I say estrogen, I mean that. So the, the cycle kind of looks, and, and listeners will, you can go online and just Google menstrual cycle, and it'll, it'll show what this looks like. So just imagine a graph with a line in the middle at day 14. Right? So estrogen starts low right at menstruation, kind of sweeps up, it's a big spike right before ovulation, drops, and then comes up and back down. Progesterone starts very low at ovulation. It goes up, peaks, and then comes back down. And that last week is typically, you know, called that's the premenstrual week. Uh, that's when if women are going to have premenstrual syndrome or, you know, I think it's called premenstrual tension in the UK. And, and, and that is going to be that fourth week. So the, there's these two phases. The first two weeks are called the follicular phase. Estrogen is dominant. That's when the follicle, the egg, is developing. That's where the name comes from. Ovulation. The second phase is called the luteal phase. That's because once the egg implants, it produces something called the corpus, corpus luteum, which produces hormones. Like I so said, this is all geared towards pregnancy. Estrogen is dominant in the first half of the cycle. Progesterone is dominant in the second half of the cycle. Testosterone also stays pretty low. Little blip at ovulation, and that comes back down. Now, most people think that estrogen is the bad guy. Look anywhere online, and estrogen is blamed for every part of women's issues. And make no mistake, it plays a role in all of this. But if estrogen does anything, it's beneficial. Estrogen decreases appetite. 
It increases fat-burning enzymes in skeletal muscle. Um, when women go through menopause, which is what happens when they're older and they're, you know, if they don't go on estrogen, their body fat goes up, their body fat patterning changes, their appetite goes up, they burn less fat. Estrogen is, in the, in the aggregate, a positive hormone. Estrogen increases insulin sensitivity. Estrogen actually helps with skeletal muscle remodeling. And there's a significant amount of research that women respond better to training during the first half of their cycle in terms of their ability to adapt, get stronger, grow bigger muscles. Progesterone is really the nasty hormone. That's really the one that causes the problems, right? So as you go into the luteal phase, that's when hunger and cravings go up. Now, interestingly, metabolic rate goes up a little bit. It's about 5 to 7%. It's about 100 to 300 calories a day. And that, that is actually due to progesterone. But food intake often goes up by 500 calories a day. That's when women crave sugar and sweets and carbohydrate and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, in America, women, you know, that's when they get chocolate cravings. Actually a cultural thing, believe it or not, in Spain they crave something else that's, I forget what it is. Chocolate is a very American thing. But progesterone like directly activates this, this uh, enzyme in fat cells called acylation stimulating protein. And I mean, progesterone is really the nasty, nasty hormone. Estrogen overall does good. Progesterone causes slight insulin resistance. Progesterone can actually bind to the androgen receptor, the receptor that the testosterone binds to, but progesterone blocks it. Right, progesterone decreases muscular protein synthesis, increases protein breakdown, makes it more difficult to adapt to training. So the follicular phase when estrogen is dominant, like that, that's when good stuff happens. The luteal phase when progesterone is dominant, not so much. Um, and, and I mean, even there you can see there's a complete change in her physiology. Right, a man, if you plot a man's hormones, it looks like that. Every day out of the month, testosterone is here, you know, whatever, fine, I'm sure there's little changes. In the big scheme, it's a flat line. Every day, he's the same. Women, every week, it's almost, you know, I divide it into the two-week the two week blocks, but every, every two, like the follicular phase and the luteal phase, she's essentially a different physiology. Um, I've seen it in the gym, you know, in terms of strength. Some women, no differences. Flatline. Other women, oh God, can go from, generally speaking, they'll be very strong after they start menstruating, a little weaker in the second half of the follicular phase, they get a little boost in strength because of the testosterone in the early luteal phase, and during that premenstrual week, that late luteal phase, oh, it's awful. I mean, talk, talk to women. They can't lift. They Their coordination goes out. They, they get... Uh, they lose their words. I mean, they, like literally their brains fall out of their head. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Like I'm not saying this to be critical. This is simply the physiology. And there are certain things that, you know, if you're training a female athlete, trying to do heavy high coordination work in that week, good luck. Her mood may be very, uh, the, the nice term is labile, which just means that she's going to be crazier than usual. And maybe that is a little bit critical. But you get women that are emotional. You get women that just break down. Um, a therapist I knew, I talked with him about this, and he goes, oh, yeah. Oh, God, every I, I wonder, like, who's coming in this week? It's like, okay, you're crying within the first two minutes. That's how it's going to be. Like, you, you may be dealing with a completely different athlete. Um, unfortunately... Women more so than men, much more variability, right? If you've got a guy and you know that he's strong every week, he's strong every week. Two women can have a completely different response. And, and PMS, I'm going to keep coming back to that, that last week of the cycle. Some women, doesn't bother them. Other women can't get out of bed. Some women are so incapacitated by cramps and pain and depression, psychological effects, that they cannot function their risk of injury is higher for very complex movements, jumping. There's all this stuff that changes that has to be taken into account. But it's so variable that there's no way to know. That's where, you know, I can give, I give a lot of generalities in the book. These are the general patterns that have been seen. Every female has to be her own best scientist. And to track these types of things, a girl that I'm training now, actually, um, one week, 
her normal workout, she's like, I, I'm dying here. I, this is the same, like, I'm dying. And she got cripplingly sore. Estrogen actually protects against muscle soreness, too. And then she started her cycle. And I'm like, okay, now we know. And as soon as she started her menstrual cycle and started bleeding, everything was normal again. So I adjusted her training, right? I keep track of this. And she usually knows. When she's warming up, she's like, I don't feel good today. And I'm like, okay. We're going to do a week of light work, right? If you're a strength power athlete, that's great. That's where you plan your uh, your deload anyway, right? You need a deload every fourth week. So I had another female athlete. She would go from being able to hit PRs to not being able to lift 60% of her max. Wow. I mean, like wow. it was the, – the change was just night and day. Her coordination would go down, like even a basic power clean. So finally, when it dawned on me to do this, I just had her do higher up machine work for a week, right? Just to get her in the gym and get her moving. Like I kept it simple. I kept it easy. I kept it light. You know, bodybuilders, I think, see less of an issue because they tend to work with less maximal loads, right? If you're lifting at 70%, if your strength drops 10%, you know, you can grind it out. You're, you're at 80% now. It's a little bit harder. If you're an Olympic lifter trying to do repeat singles at 90% or a power lifter and your strength is down 10%, well, guess what? You're at max today. Men just don't go through this. But you have to track all that and then either adjust your training or a good coach will adjust it himself. And if you look back in some of the early literature from, you know, the Russians did some of this, uh, you know, because they were Russian. Um, what's interesting is you'll, you can see changes in some countries' approach to this. The, the Chinese originally said, ah, oh, yeah, we adjust our training according to menstrual cycle. And then a few years later, they said, we don't do that anymore. And what that usually means is they've got them on enough anabolic steroids that they can train them like men now. Because once you put enough testosterone into the system, none of this matters anymore. Yeah. And yeah. So, so a lot, you know, I have jokingly said that the conclusion of my book is going to be just give all women steroids and train them like men because it would eliminate all these problems. I mean, I am very much joking, um, but I'll actually going to come back to uh, there's, a, there's a hormonal exception. There's a hormonal variant you see in women that almost does that. Actually, let me touch on that first. Um, oh, you asked, okay, menstrual cycle and fat loss, how does it affect things? I mean, like I said, the whole, the whole system is changing. Certainly during the early part of that cycle, the follicular phase, that is generally, you know, that's when hunger's the least, that's when appetite is down. Even though insulin sensitivity is high, which means you're burning a you know, good amount of carbohydrate, you can affect that with diet. Um, the luteal phase where you're a little bit insulin resistant, you use a little bit more fat for fuel, but hunger's higher. So it's like in, in an ideal world, that second half of the cycle might be a little better for fat loss, but only if you can control your diet. Like that, that's the difficult part of it. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of what's in this book is adjusting training and especially diet for those different phases to take this into account. If you're highly insulin sensitive and using a lot of carbohydrate for fuel, if you're on eating a lot of dietary fat, well, that's getting stored. When you're insulin resistant and you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you tend to get a lot of fluctuations in blood sugar and get hungry. So adjusting the diet to almost, you know, more high carb, low fat during the, the first half of the cycle when estrogen is dominant and, and clustering really your productive training there and then luteal phase, lowering carbs, increasing protein and fat, because that's what best when you're insulin resistant, focusing more on metabolic work, making sure that your hunger stays at, you know, sufficient dietary protein. I've got supplements that deal with all of the, the reasons that people get hungry and stuff. So, you know, that it's not so much that the menstrual cycle prevents or limits fat loss outside of the general the general women's physiology, but you do see some distinct differences at different phases of the cycle. You know, one interesting question that, that doesn't come up, when should someone start a diet? Now, for a man, it doesn't matter. Any day is the same as any other day. If you're a woman with a normal menstrual cycle, and by normal, I just mean it, you've got your menstrual cycle. If you start your diet in that second half when your hunger's off the map, good luck. Can it be done? Sure. But from an adherence standpoint, from a getting some quick success standpoint, probably not the best idea. 
better to wait until the follicular phase rolls around so you can at least get two weeks of good, again, this is more of an inherence issue for women just starting out or whatever, but these are factors that just nobody considers because for men it doesn't matter. So, so that's that. All right, birth control. Birth control is a nightmare in the sense of the, different, the number of different kinds is enormous. Okay, there are the pill, which is the original form, typically taken three weeks on, one week off, except for the ones that are taken 24 days and four days off. You've got the patch, taken once a week, put on once a week for three weeks and then off one. You've got an implant that goes in the arm. You've got the shot, the depot shot. You've got an intrauterine ring that you use weekly, and you've got a cervical ring that stays up there for about five years. Okay, these are all different in terms of some go through the mouth, through the liver, some are internal, some are shot. All birth control uses essentially the same synthetic form of estrogen. It's called ethanyl estradiol. However, the progestin, the synthetic progesterone, there are at least eight different kinds, all of which are slightly different from one another, divided up into four generations, from the first, which is what, in the 70s, second, third, fourth, each of the progestins affects things like insulin sensitivity a little bit differently, hunger, energy expenditure. Some of them block the androgen receptor. Some of them don't. Some of them, it depends on dose. So like the number of possibilities, oh yeah, then with the pill, you've got what's called monophasic birth control. Same levels of both hormones all month or all three weeks. Dif biphasic or diphasic, where progesterone goes up once, Triphasic, where it goes up twice, which is more like the normal menstrual cycle. Quadrophasic is a brand new one, goes up four times. So birth control is just an absolute god-awful nightmare. However, there are some generalities. right? Birth control is probably blamed more for weight loss than just about anything women do, or sorry, weight gain than anything women do. And certainly the early birth control was really nasty. It was extremely high dose. It was very, I mean, we're talking the early 70s before most of your listeners were probably born. They used to give, for example, 150 micrograms of synthetic estrogen. Now they use about 20. Like the dosages have come down so far and there's better, there's better progestins. They did some really nasty things to people. A lot of acne, a lot of androgenic effects. And by androgenic, those are like secondary male sexual characteristics. Pimples, body hair. It's all the, benef all the bad things about steroids with none of the benefits. It doesn't build muscle. If anything, it inhibits muscle growth. So women got all of the negatives and none of the positives. Second generation was a little bit better. Um, the third generation progestins, and I'd have to look up which ones they are, uh, really are probably the best choice in terms of their overall effect. They don't block the androgen receptor. They don't cause the major negatives. <clears throat> um, there's a new one, uh, drospirinone. I forget it's in. I forget what it's called. But it actually it, it is anti-androgenic. So now that's great. If if you're a female that wants to clear up your skin, avoid secondary sexual characteristics. That's fantastic. And if you're a female athlete, it's horrible because you are now blocking what little testosterone you have. And that will prevent your ability to adapt to training. But it depends on the type of birth control. Now, what about weight gain and, and weight loss? Like I said, there's a general belief that birth control causes weight gain. But the studies have generally not shown this to be the case. If anything, it's a couple of pounds. The one that really is, is, is the worst, there, there's a shot called Depo-Provera, and it is a really high-potency synthetic progestor, progestin, progesterone form. It's part of the shot. Women, I mean, the studies show like six to eight pound weight gain, and women would gain like 30 pounds. It just, some, and some women seem more sensitive to it. But in, in the big scheme, like, that one's, just, that one's awful. That one's really, really, really bad. Um, overall, birth control can also affect uh, body composition. They may cause, like, even the ones that don't change body weight, you may gain a little bit of fat and lose a little bit of muscle just because it's hitting that androgen receptor negatively. But it really just depends on the form. There's a new form of birth control that's associated with weight loss. So in the aggregate, I think some of the, the first generation, second generation progestins, and there's a chart in the book because it gets so complicated, probably cause problems. Um, some researchers think that birth control gets blamed for a lot of things that they're not responsible for. 
it's sort of a, well, I'm on birth control and I gained weight because I'm getting older and my diet sucks. Uh, I'm going to blame the birth control because the controlled studies have generally not shown that to be the case. Um, and, and from what I can remember seeing in terms of, you know, weight loss studies, it doesn't seem to really impact it as much as I think a lot of people think. What it can do is estrogen, high dose estrogen can cause water retention, um, even during the lute, you know, during the, the menstrual cycle. And this gets into tracking, which is another issue, right? Men, you can weigh them anytime. You can body composition them anytime. Women's body composition and their body weight can change week to week to week. And if you're trying to compare the fourth week of the cycle to the second week of the cycle, those numbers aren't comparable. Second week to first week, typically lightest in the first week, you get a little water retention right before ovulation, drops again in the first week of the luteal phase, goes up again premenstrually. Women have to track equivalent weeks. They have to track week one to week one and week two to week two. You cannot compare. But it drives women crazy. Oh, I'm dieting so hard. And why is my weight up seven pounds? It's water retention because you're in that, that phase of your cycle. Some birth control can cause that if it's got high dose estrogen, but they don't usually use that anymore. Um, so that that's potential. But for the most part, the newer forms don't seem to cause those kinds of problems. One of them, um, again, that, that fourth generation, it, it actually caused weight loss, but it was a lot of dehydration. And some people got into issues with like low potassium, like it was almost too potent. But women loved it because their body weight went down and it, it eliminates that whole menstrual cycle hassle. Um, that is one thing, you know, athletes have frequently used birth control for that very reason, right? And this is a performance athlete thing that has to be taken into account. Let's say you know that the fourth week of the cycle, your performance is terrible. Well, what if you have a competition? Tough. I mean, just that's it. You don't get to set the competition dates. That's set by the federation or the sport. And a lot of female athletes run into that problem, is that the competition is going to fall on their personal worst week. Now, some women have set PRs. That's that world records. Others crater. It depends on the woman. But a lot of women, female athletes, will use birth control to not only control their cycle but to regulate it because then you can – and this has to be done medically. This I don't get into in the book because it needs to be doctor supervised. You can use it to adjust your cycle a week forward or a week backwards or it, it gives that control. But at the same time, it needs to be a form that's not going to impair your ability to adapt to training. So it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, women, of course, use birth control for its typical purpose, but athletes will also use it for, for other purposes. So, you know, again, it's a choice that also men don't have to make. They don't have to really face the risk of pregnancy. and Women do. So, it, there's a, you know, this is just another problematic issue that women have to get into. So, so that's kind of the, the menstrual cycle birth control thing. Excellent. When we're talking about hormones, um, hormonal profiles also seem yes. to be an issue. Um, I know you've talked a lot about uh, PCOS. Yes. So how can that affect fat loss for females? Let's, if you could just give us a um, brief uh, description yeah. what PCOS yeah, I know. is. Yeah. So, so P PCOS stands for polycystic ovary syndrome. And it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It means there's a number of small cysts that are found on the ovaries. And it's typically, not always, but it's frequently associated with elevated testosterone levels in women, frequently two to three times normal. So a woman's normal low testosterone can be triple. It'll still be lower than, than even the lowest man's, but women are more sensitive to testosterone. And very commonly, if you meet a woman with PCOS, she may have little bit, you know, like her face may be structural a little bit because testosterone affects bone growth. It's not uncommon for her to have extra body hair. Some women with severe PCOS have to shave. Uh, they may have hair loss. They may have acne. They may have oily skin. They get those secondary male sexual characteristics. It's also very so highly associated with obesity um, and insulin resistance. Testosterone in women causes insulin resistance, and all of this ties into like this whole big problem. It also can typically cause infertility. Women with PCOS typically have a lengthened cycle, like normal cycles between like 22 and 34 days. PCOS is usually 35 days and up because that, that elevated testosterone is just wonking, is messing up the entire system. Now, from a fat loss, like I said, it is associated with obesity, but it's, the question is kind of what's driving what. Um, insulin resistance in the modern environment 
tends to be problematic. Uh, there's a lot of different thing, you know, they're, they're still even now looking into, you know, some of the mechanisms behind this. I've worked with some PCOS women, and I'll be honest with you, in a way, they, they almost have an easier, like, they, women, also PCOS women tend to have a more male body fat pattern. You'll see that much more central, abdominal, visceral fat pattern. They frequently don't have the same lower body fat. And, and at least in America, it's interesting. I'm noticing young girls seem to be having more of a male fat pattern in recent years. And I don't know if it's environmental estrogens or I don't know what's going on, but there seems to be a shift. In, but you often don't see that typical female fat patterning with a lot of lower body fat, which is good in the sense that it's, it's hard to lose, but it's bad in that you know, visceral fat can be very unhealthy and very problematic. But th this is a situation where women's physiologies become somewhat more like men. Um, and, and certainly, in, at least in my experience, uh, fairly limited. And what I, you know, they, they don't typically have the same sets of problems. I mean, there's some stuff, their fat cells may become a little bit more resistant to releasing fatty acids. A lot of this gets reversed with regular exercise. And, and PCOS women, they're, they're, it's now... A, regular exercise has to be part of it to improve insulin sensitivity and, and all that. But they're finding that weight training really has an enormous benefit. Because if there's anything that really drastically increases insulin sensitivity, increases skeletal muscle ability to, to, you know, to utilize nutrients, it's proper weight training. Um, in that vein, women with PCOS are beasts in the weight room. They're beasts in any sport. They adapt to train. Even small increases in testosterone in women have an enormous effect. And I think if you work with a lot of female strength athletes, less so physique athletes can go either way. I think female bodybuilders, you frequently see a lot of PCOS because testosterone, it, it makes you behaviorally attuned to certain things, right? There's a reason men like the macho stuff that we like, and there's a reason that women, and yes, there are social factors, I get it, but a lot of this is hormonally driven. When you meet a woman with PCOS, she will, she's what I call a dude chick, and, and I, I, that's not in any way meant to be a negative, but she's a female, but she will act a lot more like a male in her behaviors in terms of she'll be, she may be more combative, she may be more aggressive, she may be more competitive or competitive in a different way. You see this a lot more in bodybuilding, women who are drawn to powerlifting because you have to have a certain psychology to want to push heavy fives in a back squat. You have to have a certain body structure and PCOS women typically have more robust joints. They don't have as wide of hips that cause some biomechanical issues they have a natural advantage in a lot of sports. You see them a lot in strength power sports, right? Shot put, Olympic lifting, discus. This is not a sport where the typical light boned female with wide hips, she doesn't do these sports. They're not drawn to it and they're not built for it. There's even a related situation they're finding. Some women just have elevated testosterone, about 20 to 30% higher than normal. And they used to think that sports cause this, now they know that women with elevated testosterone are so successful in certain sports that they're found in a higher percentage, right? They adapt better. They build more muscle. They typically are a little bit leaner. They are more successful than women that don't have elevated testosterone. This is why anabolic steroids work so well for women. They work better for women than for men. So women with PCOS, it's, it's very much a mixed bag. Causes infertility, causes insulin resistance in the wrong environment, which is the modern one with low activity and a bad diet, very much predisposes towards obesity. When you fix the diet, lower carbs, increase protein, get them doing daily activity, that offsets a lot of this. And if they want to build muscle or get stronger, they're awesome to train. They also frequently don't have those same big ups and downs that, that women with a, a more tradition, like that women without PCOS have. And I came across this really interesting, very informal Russian study where they looked at different types of sports, you know, aesthetic sports, gymnastics, ballet. They looked at endurance sports. They looked at power sports. And they found that typically speaking, as you move from the more aesthetic sports to endurance to the power sports, you tended to see more masculine behaviors, less of an effect of the menstrual cycle, and if they'd been measuring hormones, which they didn't, I guarantee you they would have seen an increased incidence of PCOS or of elevated testosterone levels. It, it has to be that way because, again, if you're a woman with thick bones and heavily muscled, 
you don't do ballet because you won't be any good at it. You're not built for it. You, you may be able to get away like female rowers, female swimmers, even some female runners, surprisingly, have elevated testosterone. PCOS, if you want to build muscle, it's fantastic. Now, if you're a woman with PCOS who doesn't want to build muscle, you almost have to be a little more careful in the weight room. You know, women joke about, oh, I bulk up easily. Most of the times it's not true, but if you're a woman with three times normal testosterone, you very well may grow muscle faster and, and need to adjust your training. And to sort of, I think, wrap it up because I'm running long, part of the reason this book is such a nightmare is I am trying to cover all of this. And we didn't even talk about menopause and hormonal replacement therapy versus not, which is a whole, that's, that's an, an older thing, but at menopause, a women's hormones drop effectively to zero. Her entire reproductive system shuts off, right? In men, yeah, fine, we get that gradual lowering of testosterone, but it's not the same. Menopause, a woman's hormones go from this to this. Men's just, as I've just said repeatedly, men just have one 65-year-long cycle of being assholes. That's, that's kind of, women have a monthly cycle that they change every week and men is just, regardless, if a woman goes on hormone replacement, which is synthetic estrogen or progesterone, her physiology is relatively more similar, but a lot of things, energy expenditure goes down, fat oxidation goes down at menopause, like some of that's aging related, but some of it's hormonally related. So this book starts with the menstrual cycle and I talk about all these hormonal modifiers, elevated testosterone, PCOS, birth control, uh, we didn't even talk about the loss of the menstrual cycle, amenorrhea, which occurs usually at the lower ends of body fat. Women aren't eating enough. That changes her physiology. Menopause, hormone replacement therapy, and then there's partial hysterectomy. And all of these, I mean, they're all based off the menstrual cycle. You tend to see either a very estrogen-dominant situation, a progesterone-dominant situation. There can be an androgen-dominant. Like, the physiology, there's only like three kind of distinct two distinct physiologies that I've delineated, but each situation has a variable effect on that. You frequently see different goals. A premenopausal or you know, young girl who just wants to be fit is not a female athlete trying to hit 10% body fat. A woman with PCOS who wants to just have children isn't the same as a PCOS woman who wants to be a power lifter. Like, and there, there's, a, there's so much variability in this. Um, and then you get into menopause where there's a lot of masters female athletes. Some women in menopause, you have to worry about bone density loss. You have to worry about, you know, increased risk of heart disease versus breast cancer versus all these other variables. Like I said, men just don't face any of this. So it, trying to cover all of this comprehensively has turned into, as you can imagine, an absolute nightmare. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to the book coming out. <clears throat> Especially with all the topics you've already mentioned and all the other yeah. stuff. So let's let's uh, round it up with the with the last question. Mm -hmm. Like you said, females seem to adapt quicker to calorie deficits and and dieting. Yes. So is there something they should do different in regards to high days, low days, refeeds, yeah. and diet breaks? I actually. Yeah, I got – this was months ago as I got into this and I actually there, – there's been some interesting studies that gave me some convenient data points looking at how women's hormones adapt, how often, how long the refeeds need to be to kind of reset that that situation. And I've actually got some really good kind of mathed out data. And yeah, I actually – as contradictory as this sounds, I do think women probably need do need these more frequently just because their systems do fight back harder. Um, whether it's you know alternating higher and lower days, uh, there's a new approach called intermittent caloric restriction that that I mean, it's based in weight loss, but I think it has a lot of application for athletes, right? When women are dieting, when anyone's dieting, maintaining training intensity is really hard when you're on a constant diet. You get hungry, it sucks. Your hormones adapt. If you're alternating higher calorie training, heavy weight training, lower calorie cardio, like this it tends to offset some of the hormonal adaptations. Um, if that doesn't fit your schedule, some people don't like it for whatever reason, doing you know, a one or two day refeed, um, maybe better, you know, sort of a cyclical diet, uh, programming in diet breaks a little bit more frequently, probably uh, a good thing. And, I, and a lot of this is also based on body fat percentage. You know, I talked about the higher body fat percentages, the body doesn't fight back as hard at the lower, the, the numbers change a lot based on 
that body fat percentage. It also changes a lot based on how much of a deficit you're trying to create because the leptin levels will drop kind of in proportion to how big of a deficit you're on. So if you're using a very moderate deficit, 10, 15, 20 percent, you don't need to refeed as often because your hormones are coming down very gradually. If you want to use a big deficit like this, like my ultimate diet two or something, you have to refeed far more frequently. Um, of some interest, you know, Eric Helms, who your listeners, you may, I know you said you know him. Good guy. I'm really impressed with with the stuff he and, and his group is doing. Um, he's contributing some sections on the book to Peak Week and, and making weight for, for weight class athletes. But he's given me a lot of really excellent feedback. And what he's he's been training, worked with a lot of female physique athletes. One thing they do is start very early. They may start six months out from a contest so that he can diet them down gradually enough that their bodies don't fight back as hard. Right? It's another thing women do, all dieters do. I want to lose weight. I'm going to cut calories and do two hours of aerobics. And women's systems shut down. And as a scary data point, a woman does the wrong things in terms of aerobic activity and calorie levels. She can shut down her menstrual Not, I mean, it won't, she won't lose her menstrual cycle. But the hormones involved in regulating it will start to crash. And her levels of thyroid hormones within one week, which means her energy expenditure will go down, which means she is already getting into a hole. And there's actually some really good numbers on this over where that threshold is. Something they call energy availability, which is how many calories you're eating versus how many calories you're exercising. That's how many calories the body, excuse me, has available for other processes, right? It has to keep the heart beating, it has to keep your brain working, it has to thermoregulate you. And if you get into a situation where calories are too low, it shuts off unimportant stuff. Well, reproduction is unimportant. Bone density is unimportant in, in the immediate sense, Right? If your heart stops, you're dead. <laughs> you can't thermoregulate, you're dead. If you can't reproduce, doesn't matter. So there's actually some very specific thresholds that once you cross those, your body starts to fight back. Now, this has gotten interpreted in, in the general fitness industry of never bring your calories below that. Well, that's great, but guess what? You'll never get lean enough. If you're trying to get to very, very lean you have to cross that threshold at some point. The question is simply, when is it going to occur? If you do it the first week of your diet, well, guess what? The next 11 weeks are going to be horrible. If you can wait till two months in and raise calories above that level every so often with a diet break or refeeds or high days, it won't prevent it, but it'll sure slow it down. And that's really kind of all you can do in this situation. You're never going to prevent it completely, that, that adaptation. It's a matter of keeping it so that it's not making, you know, it's not making a situation where the harder you're, you know, you're dieting even harder for less of a result. Right? If the logic is, well, if I drop calories by 500, but your body fights back to 250, well, you've, you're, you're only burning 250. If you reduce 250 and your body doesn't fight back at all, well, guess what? It's the same 250 with an easier diet or an easier exercise program. Most women overdo cardio. Most women want to cut calories too low. It's just that's how you, that's how you die. Now, men can get away with it to a greater degree. Women will lose their menstrual cycle. They'll lose bone density. They can do permanent damage to themselves when they lose their menstrual cycle, damage that will never reverse itself. So the best thing you can do is just limit it. And that gets back to your question. Yes, refeeding specific durations, specific amounts at certain frequencies based on how lean you are. When getting back to Eric, he's been doing a lot of this kind of intuitively over the years and has had a lot of really good luck. He, he told me that he's been doing some of this intermittent caloric restriction. So rather than waiting till end week to do a refeed, rather than waiting two weeks, he's putting in the occasional high day or a couple of high days every so often. And he's seen better maintenance of training performance, better maintenance of lean body mass, but more importantly, less menstrual cycle dysfunction until much, much, much later in the diet. And, and that menstrual cycle dysfunction is directly related to how much of the metabolic adaptation is occurring. Like it's linked directly to how far thyroid levels have dropped. It's linked directly to how low energy expenditure. So if you lose your menstrual cycle four to six weeks in, guess what? Your body is determined to fight you back. If you can make it wait till, you know, 16 to 20 weeks in, the adaptation is, is smaller. It's still there, but it will be a far, you know, it, you won't end up having to diet that much harder that early on. 
getting women to do this, that's a different problem. But this is in premise a much better approach, especially to long-term dieting. You know, again, woman who's at 40% body fat, doesn't matter. She's not losing her menstrual cycle. It just doesn't. Well, it happens if you gastric band them, but it, you know, any, any realistic weight loss. In the middle body fat ranges, 25 to 35%, meh, not much of an issue. Once you get to the low 20s and want to get into the teens, it becomes a big issue. And, and, and a lot of the things that women are doing or that are being advocated because men or the genetically elite can get away with it are doing a lot of damage. And, and while it's great to hold up, oh, but this is, this is how people succeed. Well, yeah, the people that succeed are the ones that made it. The ones that made it to stage are the ones that made it. You don't hear about all the ones that are washing out, that are giving up, that are binging, that are just blowing up because their diet has come to a grinding halt and they're on 1,200 calories and two hours of aerobics a day. And it takes them a year to get their menstrual cycle back. You don't hear about those because they don't make it to stage. So that, that's kind of the in the aggregate, um, the answer to your question is that yes, Higher frequency, different durations, I think will will be probably more effective in the big in the big scheme to to avoid a lot of this. Excellent, excellent. All right, I think we covered um, a lot of stuff. Uh, okay, nope. Thank you so much for this awesome interview. Um, you've written several books, like we we've talked about, and you also have yeah. several in depth articles. Where can yeah. people find more information about uh, you and your website? Yeah. My, my website has been up for I don't even know how long at this point, but you can find me at Body Recomposition. That's all one word: B O D Y R E C O M P O S I T I O N. Or just go to LyleMcDonald.com and that'll get you there. Got something like 500 articles on my website. All my books are there. I've got a Facebook group that's highly, very active. Got a forum that's that's less active. I think forums are going the way of the dinosaur in the day of Facebook. Um, so you can find me mostly, pretty much, you can, my website, lots of inf free information, lots of articles, come to the Facebook group, um, and I'm there every day, and that's, and, and when the book is available, trust me, people will know about it, yeah. I don't think yeah. any issue getting the word out, so. Excellent. Okay, thank you once again, uh, Lyle, for this awesome interview, and um, have a nice day. Great, thank you, Jimmy, you have a good day. Yeah, thanks.